أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الأشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد صلى الله صدري ويأسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد والفرقان الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والأصل إن الإنسان لفي خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وآمنوا الصالحة وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد I begin in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful All praises to Allah Lord of the world the sustainer of the universe He who existed before bringing everything else into existence and he who shall remain after everything else has perished. May his choicest blessings, mercy, and salutations be upon the last of his messengers, the best of his creation, the mercy unto the world's Muhammad Mustafa And may he extend his blessings, mercy, and salutations upon the pure and immaculate family of our beloved Prophet. His Ahlul Bayt, about which the Holy Prophet has said, My Ahlul Bayt are like the Ark of Noon. Whoever sets sail with them is indeed saved, and whoever remains behind shall perish. And on the sad and tragic nights of the holy and sacred month of Muharram, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to explicitly and specifically send his blessings, mercy and salutations upon the grandson of our beloved Prophet, his family and companions. About his grandson, the Holy Prophet has said, Inna al-Husayn, misbaw al-Huda wa safina al najah Hussein alayhi salam is the lantern of guidance and the ship of salvation. As-salamu ala al-Husayn. وَعَلَىٰ عَلِيِّ بْنَ الْحُسَيْنِ وَعَلَىٰ أَوْلَادِ الْحُسَيْنِ وَعَلَىٰ أَصْحَابِ الْحُسَيْنِ Respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Once a group of Bedouin Arabs, they came to the Holy Prophet wanting to convert to Islam. And this story is told to us in the glorious Quran in Surah Hujura verses 14 and 15. They said to the Holy Prophet, Amanna, we believe. And Allah commanded the Prophet to reply, Lam tu'minu, you have not believed. Kulu aslamna, say instead, you have submitted. They asked why and replied, Walam yudkhulil imanu fi kulubihim. Because iman or faith has not yet entered into your hearts. When the people asked the Holy Prophet about the tafsir of these verse, verses, he replied that there are many people who come to Islam or within Islam for different reasons. Some of them are born Muslim but never actually practice, pay lip service to the religion. Others come into the religion through marriage, or for economic and financial reasons, or some like the likes of Abu Sufyan who accepted Islam unwillingly after the conquest of Mecca. See, to become a Muslim, all that is required is that we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by reciting the Qalama or the Shahada that is La ilaha illallah. But to become a mu'min, 
that is only possible when Iman or faith enters our heart. And that is why you find in the glorious Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often repeat the words, Kal aflahal mu'minun. Successful indeed are the believers. You won't find the verses, Kal aflahal muslimun. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about success, He's always referring to the believers of the mu'min who have allowed faith to enter within their hearts. Our subject during these nights of Muharram is the eternal principles of success, inspired by Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Yazid may have won the battle on the day of Ashura, but Imam Hussein alayhi salam won the war and continues to do so until with millions of lives being inspired and transformed across the world. <coughs> During these nights, we started our discussion on Surah Al-As, the 103rd Surah of the Glorious Quran, one of the most profound Surahs in the Glorious Quran, which the Prophet had said, if this Surah came down alone, and the believers understood it, it would be enough for them to achieve paradise. In this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the formula or the ingredients or the provisions that the believers must acquire in order that they achieve eternal success. And we started our discussions on this surah yesterday. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by saying, Wal as inna al insana. Lafi, I swear by time, surely man is at a loss. And indeed, as we saw and we showed, time destroys everything. Eventually, this dunya, this world, will be destroyed through the passing of time. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, before mankind loses all hope, He says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَآمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسُوا بِالْحَقِّ Except those who believe, do good deeds, amal salihat, enjoy on each other the truth, and enjoy on each other patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four provisions which are outside the scope of time. They are intangible. They cannot be touched or destroyed by time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four things that he asks the believers to take with them, to acquire as provisions on their journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want this eternal life or success and success. And inshallah tonight I want to discuss on the first two provisions that are mentioned in this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Illa ladina amanu wa amanu saliha. Except those who believe and perform amal salih, good deeds. Today we'll ask what is true Iman and why is it so important? How can we measure how much Iman we have within ourselves? How do we acquire more Iman? And lastly, what is the relationship between Iman and Amal as -Salih? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran always often mention them side by side? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Once when our eighth holy Imam was being invited to Khorasan of Iran, he stopped in a city called Nishapur. And thousands of people came to greet him when he arrived there. And they asked him, O oh, Imam, tell us one hadith, tell us one narration that can be traced back to your great-grandfather, Rasulullah. And so we have, most of us have heard this narration, which is known as hadith al silah al-Dahab, the, the golden chain narration. Because Imam said that I have heard this hadith from my father, who heard it from his father, who heard it from his father, who heard it from Amir al-Mu'mineen, who heard it from Rasulullah, who heard it from Jibra'il, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
Then the shahada, the kalama that we recite, the la ilaha illallah is my fortress. Whoever recites it enters my fortress and whoever enters my fortress is safe from my punishment. And of course at that time all the people began to recite it in a loud voice. And how many people throughout history seeking safety and security from punishment and from death have built fortresses and castles to protect themselves, thinking that it will give them security and then death overtook them. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very beautifully and very simply that my fortress is nothing more than la ilaha illallah where the believer can be safe and achieve security and safety from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we may ask ourselves, how is reciting the kalama of the shahada, the la ilaha illallah, safety and security from Allah's punishment? For after all, so many tyrants and oppressors under the cloak of Islam, within the religion of Islam have recited it with their tongues and committed so many oppressive acts. And the reason is that when the Shahada is recited by the tongue, the tongue is not a very secure, a very reliable fortress. It doesn't keep secrets very easily. The tongue is a very loose thing that speaks very easily. Man often finds it difficult to control his tongue. The tongue is not a very good fortress for human beings because they often find it difficult to control what they say as we all know and have experienced in our lives. It is only when the shahada is recited by our inner hearts that it becomes the fortress of La ilaha illallah. You see, the fortress, its purpose is what? A fortress is meant to protect what is inside and keep the enemy out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, make our inner hearts the fortresses of Iman by reciting La ilaha illallah. Make it the treasure chest, the vaults, the safe for your Iman so that this provision that you have acquired in this world remains safe inside you because outside Iblis is looking to take it from you, to rob you of this Iman. We are on this journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the glorious Quran, on the day of judgment is not our children or our wealth that will be of any use to us. But the one who comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this qalbin salim, this immaculate heart, this heart will be filled with iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspect this inner heart to see how much faith that we bring with us towards the day of judgment and before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our most important asset that we have in this world, not our children, not our wealth, but this inner heart, which is our safety deposit box, our treasure chest, in which we keep and store this iman, which we journey through this world, uh, and uh, when we will arrive before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where it will be inspected and emptied. You see the bank, when a bank wants to move money around, and we've all seen it, they take armored trucks and armored guards to protect that wealth as they move it around. We are on a journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our treasure is within our inner hearts. And yet shaitan is looking for that opportunity to rid us of it to take us off it, for he doesn't want to be the only one in the fire of hell. And we must be wary and guard it and protect it and make our inner hearts 
fortresses of Iman, like Allah says, by truly reciting La ilaha illallah from our hearts. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So how much Iman do we have within us, in our treasure chest, within ourselves at the moment? See, when mankind wants to work out how much he is worth in monetary terms, he will look at how much money he has in his bank account, he will look at the assets he has minus what he owes and he will say whether I am overall in debt or whether I am I am positive in terms of the net wealth or assets that he has. So how do we know about the level of Iman that we have within ourselves? Are we Muslims or are we Mu'mins? Have we submitted to Allah or have we acquired faith and become true Mu'mins? And when it comes to Iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it can be measured through something called Yaqeen, certainty. How much certainty we have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the things that are unseen. For faith is nothing other than belief in the unseen. The unseen being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the day of judgment, heaven and hell, the angels. This is how Iman is described. And they said the level of yaqeen that we have will determine how much faith we have. So the Quran describes three levels of yaqeen. The first being ilmul yaqeen, the second being aynul yaqeen, and the third being haqqul yaqeen. Now when it comes to ilmul yaqeen, the, the yaqeen or the certainty that we get through our ilm, our understanding. And the best example I can share with you of this, or an easy example, is that when we are trying to teach our children that fire is harmful, we will explain to them that fire burns you. We will describe fire, its color, the fact that it gives up smoke, that is very hot, and the children will begin to get this fear of fire by understanding something in their intellect. This is the level of ilmul yaqeen. The higher level, ilmul yaqeen, the yaqeen we have through seeing something with our eyes. Of course, when we finally, as children, see the fire, we get to understand that its, property, its properties and that it can be harmful to us. And then the highest level, of course, is haqqul yaqeen. That real yaqeen, when we truly experience the event that, uh, that gives us that faith in that thing. So, for example, when we get burnt by fire, then we truly understand that fire can be dangerous to us. And the shahids that we talked about yesterday, they operate at the level of haqqul yaqeen. Because to them, they can see paradise. They can see the day of judgment. All these unseen things are very close to them. They operate at this level of yaqeen that is high and above everybody else's yaqeen. Today I have read that when athletes train, when they train to become the best at their discipline or their sports, part of their mental coaching so that they become successful is that they have to go to bed every night imagining that they are have won that race or that competition. They dream about receiving that trophy, being awarded that medal. They begin to think about the success that they will get because they want to experience it before even they have received it. The believers in the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us through our faith and our actions that we achieve this level of haqqul yaqeen. In the way that Amir al-Mu'mineen says that if the veils were taken away from me and I saw paradise the day of judgment, it would not increase me in my yaqeen one bit. Because he was already at the level of haqq al yaqeen. That certainty about the day of judgment, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what rewards 
were awaiting the believers. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And this level of certainty grows within us as believers with the passing of time and with our experiences and with the efforts we make to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to share with you one example from the glorious Quran about how we get to the, we can get to this level of haqqul yaqeen. And this is the story of Prophet Musa and Fir'aun. And I want to share with you one incident which illustrates the level of uh, how we can achieve these levels of yaqeen and how it grows within us. You see, Fir'aun thought that Nabi Musa was nothing more than a very good magician. Nabi Musa, of course, as we know, and as many of us, if not all of us, have seen the movie The Ten Commandments, and we've read about the miracles that he performed at the time of Fir'aun. But Fir'aun, of course, thought he was God, he was Rabb, and that Musa was just a good magician. So he asked for his advisors to call all the best magicians in Egypt at the time. Because magic had reached a, a, a new height at Egypt at the time. And he said, oh Musa, I will wish to expose you in front of the people, that you are nothing but a magician. And so I will organize a challenge between the best magicians of Egypt and yourself. Nabi Musa accepted the challenge. The date was set. The magicians were called. The people were gathered. Fir'aun sat on his throne and the competition began. So the magicians asked Musa, and this of course is described in the glorious Quran to us, this entire narration. He says, would you like to begin, O Musa, or would you like us to begin? So Nabi Musa said to them, so you begin. So he said that the magicians had ropes with, on their hands. They threw it on the ground. And as we know, it became snakes. And Pharaoh was amazed. And the people were wondering, now what would be Pharaoh's and what would be Musa's? response. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told Musa to take this rod with him. He commanded Musa, throw this rod onto the ground. And as we know, it became a giant serpent and devoured all the snakes of those magicians. And what happened, the Quran tells us very clear. He said that these magicians, they bowed down and went into sijda and they said, we believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. And Pharaoh got up from his throne and he said to him, how dare you do this without seeking my permission? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran what these magicians replied to Pharaoh. They said to him, we will never accept you over the clear signs that have come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, do what you wish with us, for you only have control over us in this world. And Pharaoh, at the time, the punishment that he used to give was he would cut people's arms and legs off on opposite sides. These magicians had their hands and legs cut off. And yet they were prepared to take this punishment after what they had just experienced. So if we reflect on what happened, these magicians had heard about Nabi Musa, that he was a prophet of God. They had this level of ilmu yaqeen, that he performed miracles, that God had sent him with the miracles. Then they witnessed some of his miracles that he had performed with their eyes, ilmu yaqeen. Finally, when they were brought in a challenge with him and they experienced firsthand their Iman raised to the level of Haqqul Yaqeen. They went from Ilmul Yaqeen to Haqqul Yaqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too in our lives gives us experiences, opportunities, lessons in which He takes us on this journey from when we are young, 
where everything is ilmul yaqeen to eventually where we can get this level of haqqul yaqeen that we may not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eyes in our head but we witness him through the eyes of our hearts when we testify with our inner hearts that there is no God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we talk about this experience of the magicians there's a very important point when it comes to Karbala for many people ask why did Imam al Hussein alayhi salam simply give bayya to Yazid and avoid all this bloodshed and tragedy that the entire family of the Prophet was nearly wiped out in Karbala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this in the glorious Quran in the episode we just recounted if the magicians of Fir'aun when they witnessed the truth were prepared for their hands and their legs to be cut off but not to give bayyat to Yazid when they experience la ilaha illallah then what about Abba Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam who was the grandson of Rasulullah who was at the height of haqqul yaqeen how would he ever give bayyat to Yazid because when the heart has accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has become a fortress of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then nothing else can enter that heart nothing can conquer that heart nothing can share any space in that heart except the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad So how much faith is within our inner hearts today? How do we know how much wealth, the wealth that Allah considers as wealth is within us? You see, if I want to know how strong I am, how tough I am, then there may be a number of ways I could do this. One is I can get into a fight with lots of other people and try and measure my strength according to how well I do in that battle against them. But the easier way is I can go to the gym and I can begin to lift weights. The heavier weights I lift, the more strength I know I have. And most of the guys have done this. They've gone to the gym and seen how many kilos they can lift or push. And they determine what their level is. And the same thing when it comes to Iman. If we want to see, visually see and know how much Iman we have within us, then we know this by how obedient we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iman is seen and measured by us through our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because our obedience determines how much faith we have. The less faith we have, the less obedient we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more faith within us, the more obedient we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we pray our namaz, we have some level of iman and faith within us. If we are diligent about praying on time and establishing the prayer in our life, then our level of iman is even higher. If we pray the nafila salah, in addition to the wajib salah, our level of iman is even higher. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that our iman is measured through our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through the wajibat that he has asked from us and through the mustahabat which he recommends that we perform. And if you think about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a good example in the glorious Quran when he recounts to us about the defeat that the Muslim faced in the second battle of the Badr, which was the battle of Ahad. The Holy Prophet had commanded the Muslims after they started, they had defeated the enemy soldiers, that said, stay on this mountain of Ahad and guard it. Do not leave it so that we may be successful. Of course, the believers at that time, seeing the treasures that were left by the fleeing Kufar, were tempted by the dunya, disobeyed Allah and the Prophet went after the treasure of course the Muslims 
face a defeat after that. And of course the Muslims were very upset after such a great victory in Badr that they were defeated in Uhud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses of the glorious Quran in which he said the battle of Uhud was to expose the faith and the iman of the believers of that time. Two or three verses is very explicit that Ahad was a test of the Iman of the believers of that time. And in the same way, Karbala was a test of the Iman and the Muslimin of that time. Imam Hussein sacrifice, his invitation, Hal min Nasirin Yan Surana, was an invitation to the believers to test their faith. To answer the call, the call of help of Imam, of Imam on the plains of Ashura in Karbala. So, what is then the relationship between Iman and Amal? Why does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the glorious Quran, in many places, say "Illa ladina amanu wa amal salihat"? Talk about Iman and doing Amal good deeds. You see, if we go back to the analogy of the gym, of wanting to know how strong we are by lifting weights, which determines how much strength we have. At the same time, is it not that when we want to increase our strength, we have to lift more and greater weights. So by lifting what we can determines how strong we are. But if we want to become stronger, develop our strength and our muscles, then we need to try and lift more and greater weights, is it not? And that is the same thing when it comes to Iman and Amal. The Amal, the good deeds that we meant to do, the obedience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do, is not only tells us how much faith we have, but it also increases the Iman that we have within. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to do good deeds all the time because it is a way that we increase the faith that we store within our inner hearts. Iman and Amal are interrelated. One depends on the other. In Surah 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who believe and do good deeds, they shall have a reward never to be cut off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises eternal success. Success in this world and in the year after. When he said they shall have a reward that shall never be cut off. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us in Surah Al-Asr, he says, well, us, inna insana la I swear by time, surely man is at a loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very careful he says that man is at a loss. He doesn't say that the believer is at a loss. He uses the word insan. Because the believer who has acquired iman, who performs good deeds, who struggles for the truth and patience is never at a loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises eternal success. Success in this world and the hereafter. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The eternal success that he has told all the believers that they can achieve if they imbibe within themselves this intangible virtues and provisions that exist outside the realm of time, that are not destroyed by time, that we can take and journey on our journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by storing them within our inner hearts by making our inner hearts fortresses of Iman, of La ilaha illallah. And Karbala survives until today. Abu Abdullah Hussain is alive and motivating us and inspiring us until today. Why? Because these four provisions and three four virtues were exemplified by him in the greatest way. After all, Karbala was it not a battle of belief versus disbelief good versus evil, truth versus falsehood, and patience versus impatience.
and that is why about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the poet has said, everyone knows that they must die after having lived, but Imam Hussein taught us how to live after dying. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Inshallah, tomorrow we shall continue our analysis of Surat al Asr and these provisions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked the believers to acquire. Tonight, before we recite the Messiah, uh, the management committee have asked me to say a few words about the importance of supporting the institution that brings us this majalis, that helps us to comm commemorate the Shahada of the Master of Martyrs. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam sacrificed 1400 years ago to save Islam, as we shall see in the upcoming nights. And these majalis that are organized here today in remembrance of the tragedy <coughs> and his sacrifice is what keeps Islam alive today within our hearts within our communities. It is these majalis that are organized through the hard work and the sweat of the mu'mineen that make sure that the love of the Ahlul Bayt are inculcated within our hearts. It is where our children, for the first time, come to learn about the personality of Abba Abdullah Hussein, about who Abu al Abbas was, it is through this majalis that our children keep these memories throughout their lives of where they first met and understood who these individuals were. When Imam al Hussein called out on the plains of Karbala, Halmin Nasirin Yan Surana, is there anyone to help me? We were not there to help Abab Billah Hussein in Karbala, but today we can answer his call by supporting his message, by supporting the programs that are organized to promote his message, to talk about his sacrifice, to teach our children about what this world is about. Please, brothers and sisters, this committee have told me that they have gone through a lot of hard work and expense to organize this majalis, to book and, uh, and hire this hall, they have asked me to mention the figure that uh, that they have that, that, that they have spent that it will cost them, which is twenty thousand pounds, and they said that they have not yet um, uh, collected even half this amount. There are individuals going around tonight. Um, please support them with your generous donations. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to share with you one example before we go on to the Messiah while the collection is going round of a personality who sacrificed everything to make sure that uh, Islam was saved. Other than Abab al Hussein alayhi salam. And this was none other than his grandmother, Bibi Khadija, Ummul Mu'mineen alayhi salam. You know, many people, when they talk about her life, they say it was, of course, her wealth that spread Islam at the time. She was today what we would regard as the super rich, the billionaire of that particular time. She was Malikat al-Arab, the queen of the Arabs. And yet, as we know, she gave every single dirham that she had to make sure that Islam was spread at that time. And sometimes when we talk about her, we say that this was her biggest contribution. But I would say that in order for somebody to give everything that they have earned and owned for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then they must have a level of Iman that is unparalleled. First and foremost, Didi Khadija's biggest quality and her trait was that she had this level of faith in the beloved Prophet and his message that would allow her to give everything away for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that she was able to give all her wealth away was because she developed this Iman, this level of Iman that was unparalleled. Of course, she was the first female believer at that time. And when the Prophet was alive, of course, we know he married no other woman than Bibi Khadija. She gave everything to the extent, as we all know and heard, that when she passed away from this world, the Prophet didn't even have enough money to buy a kafan for her burial. And once upon a time she was a billionaire. It was through her iman that she was able to give everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these blessings that Allah has given us, the wealth and the bounties, is a way and a means by which we can increase our iman and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by donating, by supporting the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and the sacrifice but through the remembrance of the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tonight we are gathered here to remember that personality that is Abu al Fadl al Abbas. He was Kamar Bani Hashim, the moon of the Hashimites. He is known as Babul Hawaij, the door of Hajat. He is the son of Amir al Mu'mineen and Umm al -Baneen. But to understand Abu al Fadl al Abbas, we need to go back to the time before even his birth, when Amir al Mu'mineen asked his brother Aqil, Find me a wife who can give me a strong, brave and courageous child and son that will be the backbone and support of my son Hussein <laughs> For he knew that when the day of Ashura came that the Prophet would not be there. He would not be there. Imam Hassan would not be there. So he wanted a son like Abu al-Fadl Abbas to be there to support Imam al Hussein on that day. Imam Hussein salam, in Karbala represented the Holy Prophet. For the Prophet said that Hassan and Hussein are my sons. Abu al-Fadl Abbas was the son of Amir al muminin He represented his father in Karbala. Together Hussein and Abbas would give the greatest sacrifice to save the religion of Islam. The Vidhin Adeem that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the glorious Quran. Historians write that there was no one that Ibn Ziyad soldiers feared more than Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. From the age of eight, he was terrorizing the enemies of Islam. From dawn on the day of Ashura, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas would keep asking Imam for permission. Allow me to go to the battlefield and destroy the enemy. But Imam would hold Abu Fadl Abbas back. He would say, oh Abbas, you are my alamdar. You are my standard bearer. When you remain here, when you are here, the women and the children feel safe and secure. If you go to the battlefield, who will be there for the women and the children? Abu Fadl Abbas would never argue with Imam. For as much as he was brave and courageous, this was matched by his loyalty and steadfastness and obedience to his Imam. But historians say, after Zohar time on the day of Ashura, things now began to turn bad for Imam Abu Sayyid and his companions and his family. Abu Fadl Abbas, his three brothers had already become Shaheed. Qasim was no more, Onil Muhammad was no more. 
The situation in the camp of Imam al Hussein became desperate. The children could be heard calling out and crying out, Al Adash, Al Adash. The young children went to Bibi Sakina, historians say. They said, Oh Sakina, we are so thirsty. We cannot survive much longer. Take this mush and ask your uncle Abbas, for he loves you so much. He is the only one who can bring us water now. Bibi Sakina took the march towards her uncle Abu Fadl Abbas. She said, Ya Amu, Alatash, Ya Amu. When Abu Fadl Abbas saw his niece Sakina so thirsty and crying, he began to weep. He went to Mola to his Imam. He said, Oh Imam, if you have not allow me to go to the battlefield, then at least allow me to get water for the women and children. Allow me to go for, to the front. Imam could not deny this request. Abu Fadl Abbas prepared to go to the front. It is said, Abu Fadl Abbas took the march, he took his alam, and then as he was about to mount his horse, Imam said, oh, Abbas, don't take your sword to the battlefield in case the enemy soldiers might think you have come to fight them. So Abu Fadl Abbas took a spear, he mounted his horse, Imam Hussein and Bibi Sakina stood at the edge of the of the haven as they watched Abu Fadl Abbas ride toward the Farad. When the enemy soldiers saw the alam of Abu Fadl Abbas, they ran away from the path. They began to hide from one, one behind one another, for they knew the valor and the bravery and the courage of Abbas. Abbas arrived at the Farad. When he arrived at the Farad, he put down the alam. He began to feel the marsh. When Sakina could no longer see the alarm, she said, Baba, what has happened to Abbas? I cannot see the alarm. Her father said, Betty, don't worry. My beloved daughter, don't worry. I will fall with Abbas is at the Furad. He has put down the alarm and filling the marsh. Abu Fadl Abbas began to fill the marsh. Historians say that Abu Fadl Abbas was also thirsty in Karbala. They said that he was surrounded by water in the Farad. That he too thought about quenching his thirst with his cool water. But every time he tried to take some water in his hands, he would see the dry lips of Bibi Sakina. He would throw the water back into the Farad and say, My lips cannot be quenched. My thirst cannot be quenched until the lips and the dry throat of Sakina has tasted water. He filled the mush. He filled the mush and mounted his horse. The alam came back up. When Bibi Sakina saw the alam up again, she called out all the children from the tents. She said, come out from the tents. Water now is coming back with Abu Fadl Abbas. Umar ibn Saad called out to his soldiers. He said to them, don't let this water reach the Amen. For otherwise we will all be doomed. The enemy soldiers now began to block the path of Abu Fadl Abbas. Thousands came between him and the Khaymen. Abu Fadl Abbas on his horse tried to battle them with his spear. And then historians write that one cowardly soldier hiding behind the tree, when Abu Fadl Abbas was not looking, he took his sword and he struck the right hand of Abu Fadl Abbas, severing it immediately. The Allah was falling to the ground. Abu Fadl Abbas dropped his spear and grabbed the Allah. He continued to urge his horse forward, continued to try and battle the enemy soldiers. As he continued to try his making his way back toward the tents, historians say that another enemy soldier, this time hiding behind some others, struck Abu Fadl Abbas on his left arm. It severed the left arm of Abu Fadl Abbas. This time the Allah was fell to the ground. But before the alam fell to the ground, imagine the determination of Abu Fadl Abbas that he grabbed the mush with his teeth, that he is why his mouth will hawaii. Imagine the determination that he had to take water back to the Khamega. Nobody else would have done this. They would have given up at that point. He held the mush with his teeth. He tried to earn the horse forward with his feet. When the horse was surrounded, historians say we saw Abu Fadl Abbas. He leaned forward onto the neck of the of his horse. He began to talk to his horse, telling his horse, "Don't worry, the heavy guy is nearby. Try your best to reach the heavy for Sakina is thirsty." <laughs> the historians say when Abu Fadl Abbas had leaned forward onto the horse's neck. 
one cowardly soldier, he took a dagger and struck Abu Fadl Abbas on the head. Abu Fadl Abbas was still alive. He sat back upon his horse. Umar ibn Sa'd then called his archers. He sent fire arrows at Abu Fadl Abbas. Historians say the first arrow that was shot hit Abu Fadl Abbas in his eye, in his right eye. It covered his face with blood. But then they said it was the second arrow. The second arrow that killed, killed Abu Fadl Abbas. They said it was the second arrow which is where Abu Fadl Abbas died. Not when he was in the arm of his brother. They said why? Because they said when this arrow was fired, where did it hit? It pierced the mush in the mouth of Abu Fadl Abbas. The water fell to the ground. Now Abbas had no more reason to live because he had no more water to take to Sakina. He had no more hands to fight the enemy soldiers. What was Abbas to do? The enemy soldiers surrounded him. Arrows were shot towards Abu Fadl Abbas as he was falling from his horse. Historians say, he cried, Ya Mawla, alayka minni salam. When Imam al Hussein heard this, his heart was broken, for he heard everybody else call this call on the battlefield as they were about to become shaheed. Historians say, when Sakina heard this call, she began to weep and cry. She said, Oh Allah, don't let them kill my uncle Abbas. I promise you I will never ask for water again. <laughs> Historians say, they say that the hardest thing for them to witness in the shahad of, of, of Abu Fazl Abbas was the way he fell from his horse. They said that when a rider falls from his horse, he uses his arms and hands to cushion his fall. But they said, no, it was worse than this. Abu Fadl Abbas's body was covered in arrows. They said that when he fell to the ground, the arrows pierced the body of Abu Fadl Abbas. Abu Fadl Abbas lay on the earth bleeding and wounded. Imam al Hussein had mounted his horse and came towards the body of Abu Fadl Abbas near the Furat. The enemy soldiers had cleared from the battlefield. When Imam approached Abu Fadl Abbas, Abbas could sense the presence of Imam. He said, Oh Imam, Oh Mola, why have you come here? Now there is nobody left to protect Sakina and the women and the children. Imam said, Oh my brother Abbas, you called for my help. How could I not come? Your whole life you have served me and my family. Oh my brother Abbas, is there anything I can do for you in these last moments? Abbas said, Oh my Imam, come next to me. Hold me in your arms. Because when I was born, you were the first person I saw. Wipe the blood from my eyes because I want you to be the last person I see before I leave this world. Imam wiped the blood from the eyes of Abu Fadl Abbas. The two brothers shared a moment. And then Abbas said, Oh Imam, I have one request. I said, What is it, my brother Abbas? He said, The whole day after every companion became Shaheed, after everyone became Shaheed, you would take all their bodies back to the Haimega. But I am cut into so many pieces. I don't want my sister Zainab. I don't want my niece Sakina to see their uncle Abbas with no arms, covered in arrows, their heart will be broken. Leave me bright for Furat, oh my brother. Imam said, oh, Abbas, I should do as you request. And then Imam would sense, now these were the last moments of Abu Fadl Abbas. He said, oh my brother, I do have one request from you. Abbas said, what is it, oh my Mola? What is it, my Imam? Imam said, oh my brother Abbas, your whole life you have called me Mola. Your whole life you have 
call me Imam, but I am only your brother. Call me my brother, my brother, my brother. And this is how Abu Fadl Abbas left this world. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, don't forget to make your hajat now with the tears in your eyes. This is the time to ask Babul Hawaii to answer your du'as, to all mortage of each other's du'as. Please remember all of us. Oh, 